This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to virtual worship on this World Communion Sunday. This morning, uh, portions of our liturgy come from across the world and across denominations as ways of remembering our unity in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us be called to worship uh, with a call to worship from the Presbyterian Church of Columbia. We gather from the west to the east, from the south to the north, to celebrate the God of peace who accompanies us in our acts of peace. This God of peace accompanies us in each and every circumstance around us. We praise God's name. to confession comes from the Union of Armenian Evangelical Churches in the Near East. Faced with God's goodness, we recognize our failings. In the knowledge of God's mercy, we dare tell the truth about ourselves and our world. In the confidence of God's children, let us confess our sins with a prayer from the Episcopal Church in Jerusalem and the Holy Land. Gracious Lord, creator of this universe, in your generosity, you have given us a world of abundance and diversity, yet we live guided by greed and selfishness. We confess that we have defaced your creation and poisoned our environment through our consumerist behavior and for personal gain. In Christ, you made us brothers and sisters and intended for us to be united and yet we have built walls to separate us from those who are different from us. You gave us wisdom and creativity, and we have used those to trick each other and to develop weapons of destruction and death. You gave us laws to order our lives, and we have abused them to take revenge and punish our enemies. We love war rather than strive for peace. We ignore the poor and the weak and are and honored the rich and powerful. In all this, we have not lived according to your will. 
Forgive us, Lord, for daring to boast in our human achievements and for failing to recognize that you alone are worthy of praise. In your mercy, forgive us our sins. From the union of Armenian evangelical churches in the Near East, hear this declaration of forgiveness. From Philippians and Ephesians, God accepted us simply because of our faith in Christ, through whom our sins were forgiven. May God help us to continue to preach peace to those who are near and far. Amen. So as you remember to celebrate communion today and maybe make a donation for Peace and Global Witness Sunday, remember that the Lord of Peace is always with you. Let's say a prayer. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for sending Jesus' peace to the world. Help us all to remember that you made one world for us and that you gave Jesus as your son. Amen. Peace be with you. Our prayer for illumination comes from the Evangelical Church of Czech Brethren. Holy Spirit, grant us openness and give us understanding of what each one of us needs to receive through Holy Scripture. When we are facing a difficult choice between the easy and the right decision, help us to choose the narrow path. We also pray for all who are about to set on an adventurous journey of faith anywhere in the world. Amen. This is our third Sunday of looking at Paul's letter to the Philippians and the theme of resilience. The first Sunday, we heard that resilience is an ability to recover from or adjust easily to misfortune or change. It is the ability a tree has to bend and sway in the wind 
rather than uprooting or snapping in half. Last Sunday, you may recall the Shaker song, bowing and bending and turning, making room for one another to focus on the one thing, the mind of Christ. Paul is an example for us of the mind of Christ. How do we see it play out in his life? We will find out this morning in our text. Let us listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church today from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to law and the law a Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Paul begins by proclaiming his pedigree and status. He's very proud of his national and family identity. As a religious leader, he is the cream of the crop, the top of the heap. With all of that status comes authority, power, and prestige, all of which are highly prized by the Philippians. You see, Philippi was originally colonized by veteran soldiers as a means of payment for their services. This military stratification combined with the already highly stratified Roman elite society, made Philippi one of the most status symbol conscious colonies of the Roman Empire. There was a consuming passion to identify persons publicly according to social status. We know this because archeologists have found inscriptions like modern graffiti everywhere in ancient Philippi. Everyone who could scrape together the resources necessary to erect an inscription of some kind apparently felt the need to proclaim his achievements publicly. In order to speak into this highly stratified and status symbol conscious culture, Paul proclaims his pedigree and status. And then he tells them all it's rubbish. Can you imagine? Paul could, in essence, pull rank on any of them. And yet he says it's garbage. It's worthless. In fact, garbage or rubbish is a sanitized translation. The word Paul uses is found in the New Testament only this one time, which means we need to pay attention. In polite company, the word means dung. Some scholars think Paul is actually using an expletive. 
all the, the various forms of status and privilege that Paul has are blank. They're worthy of being flushed away. Paul jolts the status-conscious church at Philippi into realizing that any status that they have achieved or earned is not to be prized. It is blank. Their identity cannot be tied to these temporary achievements. Their true identity is in Christ. That is what is valuable. Paul wants them to break from their old identity and embrace the new. Forget what is behind you. Remember who you really are, Paul seems to say. Don't get bogged down by status, achievement, and pedigree, whether you have them or don't have them. Your identity is in Christ, who has taken hold of you, who has unleashed the power of the resurrection in your life. Remember who you really are and press ahead to the future God has for you. Uh, Bernard Kempler, a clinical psychologist and Holocaust survivor, claims that one of the important attributes of resilience is a clear boundary between what was and what is. He uses his own life experience to illustrate what he means. He was born in 1936 to a Polish Jewish family in Krakow, Poland. He was a little more than three years old and his sister Anita was five when German armies marched into Poland on September 1st, 1939. By the time the two of them were brought to Sweden by the Swedish Red Cross on April 28, 1945, six years later, they had been subjected to the full duration, the breadth and depths of the Holocaust. At almost the exact day the war ended, he and his sister were removed from the Holocaust scenario and found themselves in Sweden, a quintessentially safe, decent, civilized, and peaceful country. It was a decisive break with the past. At the age of nine, he learned a new language, went to school for the first time, began to live a normal life, and thought as little as possible about what he had lived through. Seven years later, at the age of 16, he repeated this process when his family came to live in the U.S. His quick learning of foreign languages was an especially effective means of distancing him from the past. The geographic, cultural, and linguistic boundaries marked very clear breaks for him of what was and what is. Kempler says he has always had very clear memories of his war experiences, and he was conscious of deciding to move on, to not dwell on the past, in order to create a new life. This decisive break with the past is an important attribute of resilience. This is what we see the Apostle Paul and what he commends to the Philippians and to us in this morning's text. Paul uses the example of an athlete racing toward the prize. And on this World Communion Sunday, an Olympic reference seems appropriate. Whether a runner, rower, skier, skater, or swimmer, whether they are American, Chinese, Russian, or Brazilian, when they take their place at the starting line, they cannot think about their performance in the qualifying heat or the day before or the month before. They forget what lies behind and focus on the goal of the finish line and the prize. When the starting gun is fired and they come out of the blocks and head down the track, they don't look back. They forget what lies behind and as they near the goal of the finish line, they strain forward to claim the prize. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. What are the
are the things that cause you to look back over your shoulder and threaten to trip you up rather than straining forward to claim the prize? What forms of status, achievement, and pedigree do you hold on to rather than count as rubbish? As a congregation, what are the things that cause us to look back over our shoulder and threaten to trip us up rather than straining forward to claim the prize? What forms of status, achievement, and pedigree do we hold rather than count as rubbish? Many of you probably have pictures in your head of when this church, like Paul, was a model successful in the things that we count, when there were twice as many people in worship and classrooms were filled and the budget was easily met and the slate of officers was complete. We wanna look back at those achievements to define who we are or who we should be today. Or sometimes we want to look back and hold on to the wounds inflicted by others when we all did not have the same mind. Either way, whatever part of the past you were holding on to, Paul says, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Looking to the past, believing that our best days are behind us, does not improve our resilience. Nor does being fearful of the future and the challenges that it may hold. Paul tells us that it is the power of the resurrection that gives us the ability to make a decisive break with the past and move toward God's promised future. Becky Pippert says it this way, what enables us to live this new life is the power unleashed by Christ rising from the dead. He did more than die and pay the penalty of sin. He was raised from death itself. And the very power God used to raise him is the power made available to us. Through the resurrection, God now offers us new life. Eternal life is the life of eternity brought forward to start in time. Living the resurrection is living in the old world by the energy of the new world to come. Believing that we belong to Christ Jesus and that God is calling us into the future, that is resilience. That is hope. That is the power of the resurrection. To live a new life in this old world by the energy of the new world to come. The power of the resurrection to bring eternity into the present is what we celebrate and participate in when we gather at the Lord's table. We rehearse what is to come, gathered at the table in God's kingdom where none of our pedigree, status, or achievements matter. Our national identity, our family identity, our religious identity, even our righteousness, our ability to or inability to keep all the rules, does not determine our place at the table. It's all rubbish, as Paul would say. It is only by the faith of Christ that Christ has made me his own that I am invited to this table where I remember who I am and look forward to the time in the future when I finally reach the goal. At the Lord's table, our roots are nourished and grow deeper into our true identity. We become more resilient. We can bow and bend and turn on our relationships with one another. We can bend and sway in stormy winds because we forget what is behind and strain forward to God's future. To the glory of God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, 
Amen. Affirmation of Faith is a video of people from around the world and in different languages. Nikurupirira mungu atate wampa mvionse ole ngaza kumwamba ndiza pansi. In Jesus Christ, our only Son, Señor nuestro. Jenž se počal z Ducha Svatého, narodil se z Marie Pany. Di geleden heeft onder Pontius Pilatus is gekruisigd, gestorven en begraven, nedergedaald ter helle. De tweede mera na stand op de nekron, aan el thondes tus uranus, kathezomenon en dexia theu patros pando dinam. Afian nu je afinit, wat vind je simma? Kapatau sje wang zijn er pewen jaar borisut, la sje man nesa kon pritzak borisut. Wobi sharikat el kudisien, wobi magfirat el khotaya, a test feltámadását, és az örök életet. Ámen.
near and far to sit together at God's table. Together we will eat the bread of life and drink the cup of salvation. God repairs the table with room enough for everyone. We give praise to God who invites us all to the feast. Let us give our thanks to God. Loving God, creator and sustainer of all life, you planted the first fields, wheat, barley, rice, and maize, and made us in your image to care for your creation. You fed your people in the wilderness with manna from heaven, leading them to a land of milk and honey. When human greed trampled the poor, you spoke through the prophets, calling us to worship you with justice and peace. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent Jesus Christ, the living bread, to lift up the oppressed and lowly and fill the hungry with good things. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your word made flesh. He taught us to share the abundance of your love, feeding the multitude, eating with sinners and strangers, offering his own body to save us, and pouring out his life for the world. When the risen Christ appeared to his disciples, he made himself known to them in the breaking of the bread. Even now, he sets the table for us, inviting all to taste and see that you are good. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this cup, and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and cup, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and one with all who share this meal, united in ministry in every place. As this is Christ's body for us, send us out to be Christ's body in the world. Just as the grain, when scattered across the hills, was gathered together in this loaf of bread, gather your people from the ends of the earth, so that we may feast with you in glory, in the joy of your new creation. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now in the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying that this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul reminds us that when we eat this bread, 
and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. This is the body of Christ given for you. Let us eat it together. And this is the cup of salvation shed for you. Let us drink it together. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. Help us, who have shared Christ's body and received his cup, to be his faithful disciples, so that our daily living may be part of the life of your kingdom. And our love be your love, reaching out into the life of the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you.